there's also the phenomenon of during the 2016 primaries, we saw, we saw people from the Movement for Black Lives pushing Democrats. That's right. To address race. That's right. And that was unsatisfying too. Yeah, I, it, was unsat it was unsatisfying because, again, we were only able to push people who actually weren't rooted in our values and our communities um, a little bit around uh, the way around race. I think we're really effective in, in making our issues a, a front and center issue mm -hmm. in the debate, but still it was unsatisfying. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately with, um, with the election of, of Donald Trump and his whole movement, I think many of us um, took a step back and took this question of governance even more seriously. Also of issues after the election, we had that same old familiar debate we've had a million times of, well, we should never have talked about race, we should just focus right. on class. When did that begin? When, when did class get so divorced from race in our discourse? And let's throw gender and everything else in there. I've always yeah. wondered, how did we end up with social issues and economic issues? It's not one or the other when it's affecting my body. Yeah, absolutely not. And. Uh, I, I feel really passionately about this. And for the past for the past four years in the movement for Black Lives, one of the interventions we wanted to make is that we're an intersectional movement, right? And so I don't experience something, things as only as a black person, or only as a son of immigrants, or it's, you know, I have a very complex and layered identity. And so that's how people actually experience their lives. Now, when it comes to party politics, um, this false debate, needs to be resolved between economic inequality, resolving that, um, and changing our, um, fundamentally changing the power dynamics in our economy, creating economy for all, and racial justice, and make sh making sure that people of color um, are in every way full citizens and fully are able to access our democracy, that black folks mm -hmm. are able to fully access our democracy. Those two things go hand in hand and actually, um, you know, there's a term called racial capitalism because, because people understand historically how things like the genocide of Native people and the transatlantic slave trade and the capture of African people, how that um, historically had everything to do with the development of capitalism. And so if we want to resolve these, these contradictions and these sore spots in, in our economic system, we need to deal with racial justice. And also, if we want to resolve these fundamental questions around race, we need to deal with, with economic justice. Jean-Bertrand Aristide, the president of Haiti, once said that the elections just take the temperature of the democracy. They're not the democracy. If That's you right. were to take the temperature of the Working Families Party now, like yeah. where you're at, mm -hmm. um, and we're speaking at the beginning of the summer season mm -hmm. of 2018 and the run-up to the um, midterms, um, where would you say we're at? What are you excited about, and yeah. um, where are you pushing? What I'm excited about um, is... I feel like we're in unprecedented times and we're in a time of a volatile time, right? And during times of volatility, there's, there's just great opportunity, right? If we seize it. So I think it's a question. If we seize this opportunity where, you know, we have all of these new movements that have, that have come about in the past few years, um, the movement of, of dreamers and immigrants, the movement, uh, the movement for black lives, um, the Never Again movement around gun violence, the Women's March, right? So an unprecedented sort of culture shift in how people relate to their democracy. That is, that is also an indicator of where our democracy is at. And at the same time, especially with millennials and young people, lower and lower party affiliation. Because people are finding a hard time sort of associating with these two very corporate entities. One is a center-right party, the other is a far-right proto-fascist party, right? And people have a desire, have a hunger for something different. They want an electoral expression of these movements. And they've been finding some good people to vote for in the primaries. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, people like Stacey Abrams, you know. Um, the, the Democratic gubernatorial candidate in Georgia. Yes, and we're super excited about her race. Um, you know, we've endorsed her and, you know, we have people on the ground. Um, in Georgia. And another aside around that is the collaboration that's happening around amazing visionary leaders like Stacey. So it's not just us in Georgia, it's a whole coalition of forces. Um, and so I, if I were to take the temperature, I think that this is a, a moment of great opportunity um, for people of goodwill, for people on the left, and for the party 
um, to be a political home for, for people who have those values that, you know, where you have to kind of like hold your nose and make that strategic vote, but you feel funny about it. We want to create a political home where you can feel really proud about it. And I think this is a great time where, where participation is growing, but party affiliation is, is declining. In that, in that sweet spot, that's where the Working Families Party, I think, could really be ascended. Shout out to